I have been trying to replace my good old Tech 2246A for quite a while now. A few months ago I bought a 1054Z, but that didn't go too well. You may have seen the video I made. The scope seemed great, but the software was just completely unusable for YouTubing. Luckily Rigol were kind enough to take it back. So I have been saving up for one of the way more expensive scopes with great software. I'm still saving, but now there's a new kid in town, so maybe I don't have to. Today we're going to unbox and try the brand new Rigol DH0800. This scope is in the same price range as the 1054Z. I have not been able to find any information about how good the software is, so we're gonna have to find out today. This is not going to be a proper review, I'll leave that to Dave Jones. Instead, we are going to try it out with some real vintage computer project. That was a really short intro. Because I'm eager to get this thing out of the box. And try it out. So, let's see what we got. Okay, a box in a box. Rather fancy packaging. It's sealed with a sticker here. So let's peel that off and see what we will find inside. Okay, we've got some documents in the lid here. And it's a warranty card, a packaging list, certificate of calibration, and a user's guide for the probes. The manual doesn't say, but I think these are 150 megahertz. And then we've got scope, of course. Oh man, that looks so nice. Yeah, like it already. Uh, we haven't even powered it up, but it feels so solid. I really hope the software is great for this scope, because I like what I see so far. Then we've got four probes. The DH0800 is available in several different variants. And I went with the 804. So this is a four channel scope. And then we've got this tiny, tiny power supply, a USB cable, a power cord, and a ground cable. Okay, first impression. Well, if you care about such things as look and feel, you're gonna love this scope. It feels incredibly solid. And way more expensive than it actually is. I was expecting it to be a bit flimsy because it's so small. But I don't think it's going to fall over anytime soon. I'm not saying it's heavy, but it's heavy enough not to fall over easily. As I mentioned, I went with a 4-channel scope. But there is a cheaper two-channel scope, if you're on a budget. But I'd say this is cheap enough. At the back there is a visa mount. That is a great feature, because I don't have much space on my bench. That is actually one of the two reasons I'm upgrading. My good old tech just takes up way too much space on the bench. And with the visa mount, I can just put this on the wall. The scope is powered by USB-C. And there is a guy on YouTube who has already made a battery back for the scope. So these scopes can be considered as portable now. At the back we've got a LAN connector, a USB, HDMI and a USB-C for the power supply. Or a power bank. It also has these flip-out feet. Yeah, that's a really good angle. And if it wasn't sturdy enough, it sure as hell is now. I probably sound like a kid on Christmas Eve, but my first impression is great. So let's try out the software, because that is the most important feature for me. If I can't show you on the screen what I'm doing, it doesn't really matter how nice it is. The probes look and feel pretty normal. I'm sure they are more than good enough for what I do. Okay, let's have a look at the display. One thing I can't really understand about modern scopes. Why do they take so bloody long to boot? Surely they must be able to make quicker scopes. And it's not just this scope here. 
The way more expensive scopes I was saving up for, they were even slower to boot. I would have gladly paid 10-20% more to get a scope that boots quickly. What do you guys think? Well, I don't know if it's going to matter in real life, but there's a lot of glare on the display. That display is very reflective. Not a big issue, but it would have been nice if it wasn't quite so glossy. It is, however, super sharp. Very clear and very easy to read. That is a very nice display. I think we need to adjust that probe. Yeah, that's much better. Well, this looks great, so let's hook it up to a PC and test the included software. Okay, I just finished reading the quick guide. And for PC software, it's referring to the Rigol Ultra Sigma. That sounds very familiar. I hope it's not the same Ultra Sigma as for the 1054Z. And the link was to the Chinese page. So, let's go to the DH0800 page. And downloads. There is one firmware update here. So I'll check in the scope if this is the firmware I already have. And then we've got Ultra Sigma Instrument Connectivity Driver. Oh, that takes forever to download. That is a very slow server. I'm gonna have to skip ahead here. I just had a look at what I'm actually downloading here. And this is Ultra Sigma 010601. And according to this page here, this version here is from August of 2019. So this must be the same crappy software that we tried with the 1054Z. So either this information here is incorrect, or Rigon has pretty much abandoned this software. So I'm gonna skip this. Yeah, check out this Ultra Sigma installation guide. The guide is from 2011. Seriously, what is going on with the software? Okay, let's skip it and try out the web control instead. And apparently we have to turn off the scope before we hook it up to the network. Okay, scope is connected to the network and the scope now has an IP address. 192.168.1.10 Okay, we are connected to Rigel Web Control. Okay, that was really easy. Yeah, this is looking good. So let's bring out the project and give this a try. So in Ultra Sigma that we're trying with the 1054Z, if we moved any of the knobs on the scope, it wouldn't show up on the display. So we had to replicate everything we did on the scope in the software too. So, as you can imagine, that was completely worthless. But uh, this software doesn't even have the controls. So, I'm assuming if I use the controls on the scope... Yes, it's showing exactly the same thing on the PC as on the scope. So, that is great. And it looked like it was pretty much instant. Yeah, that is a very short delay. I think that is acceptable for what I do. Yeah, this is looking good. This is already a million times better than Ultra Sigma. Okay, let's see how quick it is. Okay, so I'm gonna grab the probe and touch the output terminal on the scope and see how quick it is. In 3, 2, 1. Yeah, I think that's less than half a second of a delay. 3, 2, 1. Yeah, that is quick enough. So this is perfectly usable for YouTube stuff. This is exactly what I was looking for. I guess the next thing is to try it out on a real project. I'll grab a motherboard. Okay, the cursed Commodore PC-10. If you're new to this channel, there used to be a Varda battery over here. And it obviously detonated. How about global thermonuclear war? And nuked half of the bloody board. We have already done tons of work on this Commodore on this channel. Repairing traces and replacing bad components. And it's still not working. So let me connect some power 
And we'll poke around with the scope and see if we can find something interesting. It's been a while since I worked on this board. But if I remember correctly, voltages are good and all the pins on the CPU looked fine. And I think we checked all the RAM chips and every single component is replaced in a damaged area. Okay, let's start with something simple here. Let's check the voltages and see how this software works. Okay, nice and clean 5 volts and 12 volts and minus 12 volts and here's another 5 volt rail. If I remember correctly, all the pins checked out good but let's check them again just to try out the scope. So VCC is fine and the software is definitely quick enough. Yeah, it's pretty much instant. Okay, so let's check the reset pin. So I'll turn the machine off and turn it on. Yeah, that looks good. So it just briefly jumps up to 5 volts. So reset is fine too. So then we can move on to clock. Clock looks good too. Let's see if we can measure the frequency. Oh, here it is, I think. So let's check the clock again. And we're running at 7.2-ish megahertz. Let's move that trigger point. Yeah, I think that clock is fine. I'm not sure about this thingy here. So let's check the address and data pins. So I'll just quickly go over all the address and data pins. They were fine last time we tried them, so I don't expect to find anything here. Yeah, same thing on this side. All the address and data pins look fine. Okay, so the CPU is ticking along nicely. So if I remember correctly, there was some funny signals on one of these chips here in the last attempt to repel this board. But I didn't have a spare chip, so we didn't replace it. And these chips are tested in the TL866, but I don't think we can trust it entirely. So let's see if we can find that weird behavior. So the first chip here is the 74LS245. And it's a bus transceiver. So this pin here is VCC. And we're getting 5 volts. So I'll just quickly go through all these pins here. Uh, they look pretty normal. Well, that doesn't look too normal, does it? Yeah, that looks a bit weird. So, instead of jumping up to 5 volts right away, they are slowly rising to... well, 2 volts. That definitely doesn't look right. I don't have a working board to compare with. Same thing with this pin. Yeah, same thing with all the pins on this side. So let's replace that chip and see how the signal looks. Okay, let's turn that machine off. And pull that chip. Since it checked out good in the TL866, uh, I didn't replace it. So this is the original chip from 1988. And this is a brand new chip that has been tested. So let's turn that Commodore on. No, that looks the same. So either the signal should look like this or something is causing it on this side of the chip to rise very slowly instead of jumping up to 5 volts right away. I just realized the mistake I have done while testing this board. This project has been going on for quite a while so I don't quite remember everything we have tested so I went back and checked and one of the things we have checked is a CPU. And that's where I made my mistake. Because when we tested the board with a different CPU, that CPU was rated for 4.77 MHz. But as we saw a couple of minutes ago, this board is actually running at 7 something MHz. So that test was completely useless. And has to be redone. I don't have an 8088. 
rated for 7 megahertz. So we're gonna have to go with a V20. So let's turn the machine on and wait for a beep. Well, that didn't make a difference. But at least now the CPU is tested. Well, the diagnostic ROM is pointing us towards RAM Bank Zero. But as far as I can remember, everything looks fine down here. But let's check them again. So that's address line 8. D in right RAS address line 0 1 address line 2 address line 1 VCC and on the other side well VSS isn't going to show anything and CAS D out A6 address line 3 address line 4 address line 5 and address line 7 so everything looks fine in bank 0 well we have fixed a couple of traces and replaced a couple of bad chips since we tested this board with a graphics card so let's try that again and see if we get anything on the screen at all okay CGA display and a CGA card in the slots Let's see if we get anything on the screen. Well, the screen went black. And that's all we got. Well, then we know. Still nothing on the screen. Okay, I did some poking around on the board. And this side of our suspect chip here is connected to the ISA slots. So that's slowly rising 2 volt signal. That's what our graphics card got. It's also connected to this 10k resistor pack here. So first I thought, perhaps that's a pull-down resistor. And uh, perhaps that was making our signal rise very slowly and only reach about 2 volts. But I checked. And uh, this resistor pack here is actually connected to one of the voltage rails. So that's actually a pull-up resistor. And aside from this, it's also connected to this side of this bus transceiver here. Uh, that chip is brand new. And then it's connected to this bus transceiver up here. And this chip here is connected to the graphics chip. This graphics chip actually had a burn trace underneath. So that is definitely a suspect. And then it's also connected to these two bus transceivers over here. And that's about it. So, my main suspect now is that either this chip here or one of these two is shorted and causing that signal to go weird. So let's put those chips in sockets. Okay, so here's our burn trace. And it's connected to the VCC of our suspect chip. So something really bad happened here. That burn trace was obviously not caused by the battery. So I think that burn trace was the cause why this machine was put out of service back in the 80s. Or perhaps in the early 90s. And that trace was actually really thick. So it must have had a lot of current going through it. This area of the board isn't too badly damaged by the battery. So, some fresh solder to the pins should be enough for an easy removal. I should probably clean my desoldering gun a bit more often. What do you guys think? That is a lot of solder. Well, with a bad short like that, I'd say it's a pretty good guess that that graphics chip is fried too. So that's why I'm testing the board with a graphics card in the ISA slot. Oh, and I straightened up the pins off camera, by the way. They were bent, of course. So I've had this project for years. And I've basically used it to test new tools and new gear. So this project has been going on for a very long time. There's going to be a void on this channel once we get this board up and running.
But something tells me that once this board is working, I'm going to find another cursed Commodore. So I'm not too worried about running out of projects. So let's heat up those legs and gently pull that chip out. Yeah, those pads look just fine. Now let's install a socket. I'll start by soldering one leg on each side in the middle. And then make sure the socket sits flush. Yep, that looked fine. So we can solder the rest of the pins. And I'll skip ahead here. Now let's clean that flux off. Yep, that's good enough for me. Okay, chip out and socket installed. Let's see if anything has changed. Well, signal still looks good on this side. But how about this side of the chip? That's interesting. It's definitely different. Well, it's different, but it's still weird. I think it's going slightly higher in voltage now. Let's check. How do I change this thing to peak to peak? This should be an easy thing to find. So where the heck is it? Ah, here we go. And here's peak to peak. And we're getting three points something. But it keeps moving. It has tons of these small spikes. And an occasional slow rising spike that goes up to 3 point something volts. Well, that leg looks different. That actually looks normal, so what's that pin? Okay, that was the enable pin. Um, that pin, I think, is hooked up to this chip here. That is controlling that 74 LS245. Well, I guess we should try and install the chip. Okay, let's turn the machine on. I seriously doubt that that made a difference. Same weird signal. But notice that it's different from before we pulled that chip. Does this mean we have several bad chips? We'll definitely test that chip later. But first, let's pull the other two chips. I'm not sure if I mentioned it before. But I think these were 74LS245s too. And I actually think they are quite prone to fail. The graphics chip is a suspect too, of course. But I can't see how it could interfere with the bus. Because I'm pretty sure it's connected to the bus through that chip we just removed. Well, in a way, I wish the previous owner had removed that battery before he put it into storage. But at the same time, it's I find it quite interesting to try to find that fault. So maybe everything is in order. If you're playing along, by the way, don't be too quick to straighten those pins up. Make sure that the solder actually has melted before you start bending on the pin. Otherwise you're going to lift one of the pads. I think this board has seen enough horror. So I better be nice to those pads. And go really slow. Oh, what a joy to use a freshly clean desoldering gun. I'm kind of surprised it worked at all with all that solder inside. Well, the board is cursed, but I have to say I'm really happy with the scope. That's pretty much all I need for the stuff I do. But I will upgrade again, as soon as they make a scope that boots up really quickly. Okay, same procedure. I'll make sure that whatever is left of that old solder is molten. 
before I even start to pull that chip. Only this time there are two chips. Well, I'm not going to bore you with soldering. So I'll skip ahead here. Okay, chips are out. Uh, new sockets installed. Let's turn that board on. Just make sure it's running. Yep, running. And it's still looking good on this side. So what will we get on the other side of the chip? Huh. Well, exactly the same thing. No change whatsoever. So let's install two new chips. So let's get a couple of new chips in these sockets. And uh, these are brand new parts from a well-known supplier. I had to wait forever for these, by the way. They were out of stock for months. I needed a few for another project. But since they took so long, I went ahead and ordered some extra. Uh, maybe that was a good thing. Okay, power on. And fingers crossed. No, that looks exactly the same. So that makes me wonder... Well, I think this chip is enabled. I'm not sure it should have a pulse like this to be enabled. Or if it should be high or low. But we definitely have some activity on the enable pin. Back to the drawing board. Well, the way this works. Bus transceiver is letting through the signals in one direction. Depending if this pin here is set high or low. So for our next tests, I've bent that pin out. And I think it's in a high state when it's completely disconnected. But it doesn't really matter whether it's high or low for this test. Now let's check what happens when that pin is probably high. So I'll turn the board on. Well, that looks different. It's still messed up, but it's definitely different. And it's pretty much the same on all the pins. Okay, now let's pull that pin low. Okay, pin 1 pulled low. Let's try again. Okay, and now we're getting nothing. So, presumably... The data is only allowed to flow in this direction, when this pin is set low. And when we set it high, data is supposed to flow in the other direction. So why are we getting this garbage? And uh, not what we're seeing on this side here. That stuff looks much better. Okay, next I'm going to order replacements for these chips here. And uh, new sockets for these two chips here. I have cleaned the corrosion off the pins, but they may still have some bad connections. I'd love to hear what you guys think might cause these strange signals. Or if you have any other interesting ideas we could try out next. As for the scope, well, it's great. That scope is a keeper. It does exactly what I need, and it does it really well. I want to end this video by saying thank you to my patrons, you guys are great, thank you for your support. If you want to help me make more and better videos too, consider becoming a patron, you can use the link in the description. If you want to help me grow the channel, like, subscribe and leave a comment, and I'll see you guys next week.